Welcome to our show, Ask Your Doctor. For today's show, we have Dr. Kohli here with us. Dr. Kohli is a board certified nephrologist with advanced training in transplant nephrology from the prestigious University of Pennsylvania. He is also an American Society of Hypertension Certified Specialist in Clinical Hypertension. He practices in New Jersey and is one of the managing partners with SMC Physicians Group with multiple office, office locations in South Jersey. He has previously served as Assistant Professor of Clinical Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. He has previously also served as a co-director of Kidney Transplant Program and managed the Hypertension Clinic at VA Medical Center in Philadelphia. So without any further delay, let's welcome him onto our show. Hi, doctor. I hope you're doing well and welcome to our show. I'm doing well. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me and, and thank you for the kind introduction. Yes. Uh, doctor, I was hoping, can you please introduce yourself a little, uh, you know, about what you do exactly and, uh, you know, what, what are your practices and basically a little introduction about yourself to the viewers watching the show right now? Sure. Um, just to allude on, on the introduction that you did, clinical nephrologist, uh, which is in, in, in general terms, nephrologist is the name um, uh, for, for a kidney doctor. Um, uh, apart from uh, practicing that, I, I also have special interest in transplant nephrology, um, as well as um, clinical hypertension, which is high blood pressure. Um, those are some of the things uh, we manage um, in, in, in our offices, apart from seeing patients with complex hypertension. We manage patients with all stages of kidney disease uh, from, from initial stages all the way up to what we call end-stage renal disease, where they may need dialysis or, or transplant as one of the options. So we do see the whole spectrum of kidney disease from, from very mild to, to very severe. Uh, so doctor, uh, can we talk a little about nephrology? So you just said that nephrology, uh, nephrology is related to kidneys. So um, can you give a brief introduction about you know, what exactly kidneys do in our bodies and what are some common kidney diseases uh, that you, know, you as a doctor, you see on a daily basis? So kidneys, I guess most of us see the kidneys as organs that clear the toxins or that filter out the waste products out of the body, which is true. And that's the most primitive and the most basic function of the kidneys is to get rid of, of all the waste products and the toxins. However, um, there are many more other functions that um, a healthy kidney does in the body. And when the kidneys do not function um, fully or when, when, when the kidneys are chronic kidney disease, then many of these functions are impaired. Kidneys do play a role in, in um, producing a hormone called erythropoietin, which, which is basically uh, helps in formation of red blood cells and, and increasing your hemoglobin. So as you can imagine, if, if your kidneys are not functioning well, uh, people tend to get anemic. Kidneys also play a role in controlling the blood pressure through a variety of mechanisms. Vicious cycle because uh, uncontrolled high blood pressure lead, can lead to kidney disease. On the other hand, people with kidney disease tend to have difficult to manage high blood pressure. Um, so kidneys do play a role in controlling your blood pressure. Um, apart from the blood pressure, clearing the toxins, the, the hemoglobin, kidneys also are important for healthy bones. Kidneys uh, produce active form of vitamin D, uh, which um, in, in conjunction with other hormones. So when kidneys are not functioning 100%, people tend to get what we call um, bone mineral disease or, or in, in simpler terms, it's, it's just weak, weak bones, fragile bones um, prone for fractures. Kidneys also control a lot of electrolytes in the body, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, the, what we also call acid-based balance of the body, which again, in simpler terms is, is uh, how the metabolism works in the body at every step. And if there are derangements at any of these steps, if the, any of these electrolytes are too high or too low, um, that can um, be incompatible with life. So kidneys do a lot of, lot of functions um, in the body other than just clearing the toxins. Um, I hope that answered the question. Yes, yes. Uh, so doctor, how common is the kidney diseases and what are actually the basic causes? You just did give a uh, you know, heads up about you know, some common causes, uh, but in detail, can you uh, give us uh, and talk about some chronic kidney diseases? 
just to throw in some numbers, I, I, I think we all recognize just with, with, with uh, seeing uh, many people around us with, with kidney issues these days, the incidence of kidney disease all over the world is increasing. And just to throw in some numbers, the most recent data, the United States itself has more than, it's estimated that the United States has about 25 to 30 million people with diagnosis of CKD or chronic kidney disease. Over 700,000 or over 7 lakh people in the United States are on, um, on, on dialysis. Around 100,000 people are on wait list for, for the kidney transplant. And, and to that list, every year, 20,000 uh, 20, people are, are added to, to the diagnosis of end stage renal disease, meaning at least around 20,000 people end up on dialysis every year, in addition to what's, what's already there. And unfortunately, of, of all those 100,000 people on the waiting list for the kidney transplant, about one third or one fourth of them tend to have some complications or die of cardiovascular issues. So it's a major, major health issue, public health issue that needs a lot of attention and a lot of attention on, on, on a bigger scale from public health point of view, but also from individual perspective to, to, to be cognizant of their own health. In regards to the major uh, etiologies or major reasons why people tend to get kidney disease, the most common reasons for, for people to get what we call chronic kidney disease, and, and this is different from what we call acute kidney uh, injury. So I'm gonna focus on, on uh, the chronic kidney disease. This, uh, the most common causes of those are number one, diabetes, and number two, high blood pressure. And this is true all over the world now with, with um, the diets um, all over the world getting sort of more westernized. Uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled blood pressure, certainly number one and number two on that list. The other, there are, are other um, diseases or other uh, reasons why people can get kidney disease. There are some, there is, there are a few genetic diseases, something called polycystic kidney disease that ten, tends to run in the families. And that has, that needs to be recognized sooner as uh, earlier uh, as well, because that has other sequelae on your health. Uh, it's also now recognized over the past few years um, that African Americans as a race has uh, have more uh, they are more prone to get high blood pressure and kidney disease because of a protein uh, of a gene now recognized as uh, ApoL1. So there is some genetic component to this. And apart from diabetes, high blood pressure, these genetic components, there are also something called glomerular diseases, which for for in general or simpler or lay terms, is is pretty much where the filters within the kidneys start to get inflamed or damaged and people start to leak protein. And that can happen for, from a variety of diseases, including lupus or other autoimmune diseases. Uh, by autoimmune, I mean where your body's immune system starts to attack its own, own um, cells or uh, own uh, organ systems, including the kidney. The other thing that I would emphasize, uh, because uh, it's, it's something that's upcoming is the use of medications, which, which can sometimes be toxic to the kidneys. And many people do this uh, unknowingly, so as to speak. Most common ones are over-the-counter pain medications, the ibuprofen, Motrin, naproxen, Aleve. If taken on a regular basis, and uh, you don't pay attention to, to your kidney issues, or if you already have kidney issues and you are taking these medications, you can make things worse for you. The other thing, um, particularly in, in, in um, our society and in, in, in South Asian population, there is a lot of use of herbal medications uh, for a variety of reasons. You can never be 100% certain about what ingredients are in those herbal supplements. So that, that's, that the fear of unknown of what it may have that can impact your kidneys. In fact, uh, even in the United States, there was there have been studies done where, where the supplements from best sellers in, in the market were, were tested and they were found to contain steroids, lead, um, sometimes even carcinogens, because even in the United States, the uh, none of the supplements are regulated by FDA. So I would say diabetes, high blood pressure, um, and medications or these supplements are the big reasons uh, for increasing uh, incidence of, of kidney disease, and, and not to mention the physical inactivity and the obesity is contributing to this for sure as well. Doctor, uh, what are some common symptoms, you know, that anybody with a 
let's say acute or even the dangerous what are some common symptoms that a body can show if there's something wrong with the kidneys um you know can you talk about the uh, symptoms part and also can you talk about when must a person visit a nephrologist in regards to the symptoms for run of the mill chronic kidney disease that happens from diabetes and high blood pressure it does not cause any symptoms until usually at the late stages that's the reason i think um, pre preventive care is very important meaning even if you're otherwise feeling okay it's, it's good idea to, to get uh, annual checkups for your blood pressure get get some blood work to make sure your kidney numbers on that blood work are okay uh, in regards to the symptoms once the kidney disease advances to a certain point uh, for i'm talking about the chronic kidney disease from from let's say diabetes and high blood pressure once the kidney disease in, is in late stages where where it, the percent function is less than 30% people can tend to get difficult to control blood pressure they can start getting swelling in the legs um they, some people may notice decrease in um, the amount of urine they make um and as as the disease advances further and and towards late late stages uh, it can cause what we call in medical terms uremic symptoms people can see notice a lot of itching all over a lot of hiccups at times decrease in the appetite nausea sometimes worse in the mornings uh, vomiting um and eventually if if it's not controlled people can uh, even start appearing confused to their family members around so the point is many of these symptoms are, are not recognized until until it's too late so the approach should be proactive this is for the chronic kidney disease but from some of the other um, disease processes that can lead to to kidney issues as i mentioned about polycystic kidney disease those patients sometimes can have pain in the flanks where the kidneys are because those cysts can rupture sometimes they can cause blood in the urine and some of these what i earlier mentioned the glomerular diseases where the, your filters get damaged you tend to leak a lot of protein in the urine so some people start to notice that their urine is is does not appear normal it appears very foamy because of the presence of protein and those people again tend to get a lot a lot of swelling in the legs and and their blood pressure control uh, starts to be difficult so those are i guess major ones in regards to to the symptoms to the second part of your question uh which was when uh, someone should start seeing a kidney doctor if someone already knows that they have uh, some degree of kidney disease the kidney disease we divide into five stages one through five one being most mild form five five being the most severe it's typically recommended that your general practitioner or your primary care doctor should have you see a kidney doctor around early stage 3 i mean it never hurts to even start seeing a kidney doctor uh, uh, sooner um but but certainly once it's it, it, it's showing some progression and the, and the reason is um the role of the kidney doctor at that point is to to try and do every measure possible to to halt the progress of your kidney disease and and try to keep your kidney numbers stable and prevent this from worsening to the point of needing dialysis people with diabetes and you know their kidney issues uh, so when must a person with diabetes go see a nephrologist and also uh, what can be done uh, to prevent or slow down the process or the progression of the ckd so the first part uh, for the diabetics when they should start seeing so typically if your diabetes let's say is being managed by your primary doctor or if you're seeing an endocrine doctor for for management of your diabetes a part of the work up a part of the blood work that they get every let's say 3 to 4 months depending on 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 the control of their their diabetes as well as depending on other health related factors part of that blood work uh, usually and it should include uh, checking your kidney numbers what's uh, what's uh, what's called a creatinine their management also should include checking for protein levels in the urine very briefly allude to both of these the creatinine and and the protein levels in the urine and why those are important so the creatinine basically it's it's a waste product that comes from the uh, metabolism of your muscles and since it doesn't serve any purpose in the body your kidneys get rid of that into the urine when your kidneys are not functioning 100% the creatinine level starts to rise in the blood so if if you're noticing on your blood work that the creatinine is not normal you should be seeing a kidney doctor at that point 
in regards to, so in some people, the, the kidney number, the cran in itself may appear normal, at least sometimes in the early stages. But if you're a diabetic and if you're, there is evidence that you're leaking protein in the urine and that's uh, evident on a urine protein uh, test called urine, uh, random urine protein or protein cranin ratio. If you're leaking protein, that means the diabetes is starting to, to damage the filters within the kidneys. And the reason that is important is because we know for the fact the more protein you lose in the urine, it does affect your cardiovascular health. People with, with more protein leakage in the urine tend to get more heart attacks, more cardiovascular sequelae, including strokes. Um, they tend to, to lose their kidney function sooner and the, ch the chances of getting to end stage kidney disease is higher in people with, with more leakage of protein. So for diabetics, they should be getting their creatinine and, and the protein levels in the urine checked. And if there is any concern, should be seeing a, a kidney doctor. In regards to prevention, unfortunately, there is, at, at least at this point, I know there is a lot of work going on uh, behind the scenes with this, but at least there is no medication so far where we would say, take this medication and then your kidney numbers are all gonna get better. I'm talking about the chronic kidney disease, which is happening over the years and is leading to some scarring in the kidney. So at that point, your, your management pretty much to, to prevent worsening of the kidney issues is having a good control of your diabetes. And uh, typically what's recommended is that your A1C number, which is typically checked for the control of diabetes should be, should be less than seven. It, there are some caveats to it, but that holds true for most people. If you have high blood pressure, which most of the people with kidney issues tend to have anyways, the blood pressure should be, uh, should be kept under control. Always tell them to get a blood pressure monitor, check it at home, log those readings, get those readings to your doctor so that we know what's going on and whether your blood pressures need any changes to the medications or not. And, and there has been now data that if you go to doctor's office, about one third of the patients uh, subconsciously have this anxiety, what's labeled as white coat hypertension, where their blood pressures tend to run high in doctor's office. So it's always a good idea to, to check your blood pressures uh, in, in routine at home as well. Since we are putting so much stress on, on controlling the blood pressure and, and measuring blood pressures at home, I would just take a minute to, to emphasize on a couple of things. If you're checking blood pressures at home, make sure your monitor is, is right. Take, take your monitor to your doctor's office. They can calibrate it. They can check whether that uh, monitor is giving you the right readings or not. When you're checking blood pressures at home, typically what's recommended as, as you should be sitting without folding your, your legs so your, and your legs should be rested on the floor. It should not be hanging. Um, your arms should be rested roughly at the level of your heart and, and your bladder should be empty. If you smoke or if you drink a lot of caffeine or tea, uh, you should avoid uh, taking any caffeine for about at least 30 minutes prior to checking your blood pressures. And uh, try to sit in a quiet room for a couple of minutes before checking your blood pressure. So control of diabetes and control of blood, uh, high blood pressure certainly helps along, uh, goes a long way in, in pre preventing the kidney disease from getting worse. And most importantly, the third thing, uh, which I had mentioned is, is making sure you're not taking any medications unknowingly that can affect your kidney function or that can make it worse. If you're not sure, talk to your doctor before starting any new medication. If you have kidney disease to begin with, then you must talk to your kidney doctor before starting any new medications or even supplements that may appear benign. And I, as I had already mentioned, I tend to, to stay away from, from the use of supplements for, for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Yes. Can we focus a little on different types of treatments that are available uh, for kidney failures? Is it, uh, you know, curable by medicines or do you have to go, always have to go through dialysis or are there any other treatments available? I assume the ki by kidney failure, uh, you're pointing towards later stages of kidney disease or, or yes. what we call end stage kidney disease. So again, I'm not uh, focusing on what we call acute kidney injury. Many of those tend to recover. That's in someone who had, let's say, normal kidney function, some health issue happened. They had huge surgery, major trauma, their kidney function worsened. Many of them tend to recover. About two thirds of them tend to recover. I'm talking more about the chronic kidney disease, which is happening over the years and slowly sort of eating up your kidneys and then causing the scarring in the kidneys. When that gets to the point of, of stage five kidney disease or end stage kidney disease with percent function less than 15, 
when you have symptoms coming uh, from the kidney disease, at that point, unfortunately, um, uh, most people will, will then need to have a definitive treatment, which is either dialysis or transplant. Um, there are indications when to start the dialysis. And again, that's uh, best to talk to your kidney doctor at that point about the timing of dialysis. Those two options, the dialysis and um, the, the transplant, um, the kidney transplant by far is uh, a better option if you can have a transplant. And within the uh, transplant, if you have a living donor, um, a donor who is willing to donate their kidney, um, that is um, better compared to getting a cadaveric or disease donor kidney. Just giving you the numbers from, uh, from, from the United States and, and, and the region where I practice, um, if you have a donor, uh, you can get kidney within a span of few months. I mean, you can get a kidney transplant with, within a, a span of few months. And the reason that is important is the more you stay on dialysis, the worse it is for your cardiovascular health. About um, two thirds of patients with kidney disease over age 65 tend to get some um, sort of a cardiovascular disease, um, either congestive heart failure or heart attacks or strokes. Um, so it is important to, if, if in case you have started dialysis, it's, if you can, you should minimize your time on dialysis and try to get a transplant if you can. So a living donor transplant is, again, better. But if you either do not have a donor, um, let's say if you don't have a, a donor, then you you're otherwise and and you're otherwise a candidate for transplant then you tend to wait on a waiting list and, and the waiting uh, can vary depending on where you are um, where I practice in, in in New Jersey and even in New York area the the wait time can depending on your blood type can vary from anywhere from five to seven years so it's hard the reason many people with uh, in stage kidney disease tend to to go on dialysis because either they're not candidates for transplant, meaning not everyone who has kidney disease will qualify for transplant either because let's say if their heart is weak or if they have other medical issues or if their vessels are, are so calcified that there is no way someone can put a kidney into it. So they go through a screening who can qualify for a transplant. Let's say if you do not qualify for a transplant or if you're waiting for a transplant to happen, then you'll need to start dialysis. The dialysis in a nutshell is basically a dialysis machine taking over the function of the kidneys where the blood goes through the dialysis machine. I'm talking about the hemodialysis and it cleans it up and, and returns the clean blood to your body. The dialysis basically is, is, is of two types. One is what we call hemodialysis, hemo meaning blood. The other one is a peritoneal dialysis. Similar in many ways, but different in many ways as, uh, as well. There are pros and cons for each of those approach. You just need to talk to your kidney doctor at that point, what fits best in your lifestyle and what, because a lot of other social factors, your living situation, the cost of it, uh, a lot of these things can impact which dialysis you choose for yourself. Personally, um, everything being equal, I tend to try for peritoneal dialysis in as many as patients I can, unless I have a reason to not to do so. And, and the reasoning for that, uh, it's particularly for young patients who, let's say, are otherwise working. The peritoneal dialysis can be done at home after uh, initial training of a few weeks. And you need to just go to the dialysis center once a month. You can adjust your prescription at home with help of your doctor. You get dialyzed while you're asleep uh, with, with, with the machine called a peritoneal dialysis cycler. And you unhook yourself during the day and you're good to go for the day. That typically is, is done uh, every night. Compared to hemodialysis, uh, which most patients uh, tend to go to a dialysis center um, usually three times a week. Each treatment is usually about four hours or so. Um, and that requires a shunt to be put in your arm. So imagine get, get, trying to, so kidneys work 24 seven, 168 hours a week. And now you're trying to squeeze in that function into four hours or, or, or over 12 hours over, over the course of the week. So it takes a toll on your body. Um, interestingly enough, there was a survey done uh, in the United States about, about 10 years back now, where they asked a simple question to, to the nephrologist and the dialysis nurses. All they asked was, if your kidney function were to get worse, what dialysis would you choose for yourself? About around 90% of them chose peritoneal dialysis, about 10% chose hemodialysis. Ironically, in the United States, 
90% of our patients are on hemodialysis and 10% are on, about 10% are on peritoneal dialysis. There are a lot of factors that can explain those. I would not dwell into those, but there has been a push to move towards home modalities, which mean, meaning dialysis options that can be done at home. That includes peritoneal dialysis and something called home hemodialysis as well. And I, again, personally also think for in, in, in developing countries like India, um, the cost of peritoneal dialysis um, also less compared to hemodialysis. So there should be a more push from, from the kidney societies there and, and from the government promote those modalities. Kidney disease to the point of needing dialysis or late kidney disease should not be considered a death sentence. I mean, they, there are, uh, I've had patients who lived for many, many years with kidney disease and then even on, on dialysis. It, it all depends on how well your other fa health, health issues are controlled um, and how diligent you are with, with a lot of things. So uh, this certainly can be managed um, with dialysis, but again, the treatment of choice uh, once the kidney function gets to that point is, is transplant if you can get one. Uh, so doctor, can you talk a little uh, about, uh, you know, uh, kidney stones? I think kidney stones are one of the most common um, issues that a lot of Indians, especially South Asians, they go through. So why exactly does these kidney stones happen or are they even real? And, you know, uh, how can one, uh, you know, understand? The kidney stones itself over the years, particularly if you have multiple stones, particularly if you have stones big enough to block the, the flow of the urine, they can start to damage the kidneys um, uh, over the years. And, and sometimes even acutely, if, if this stone burden is, is a lot and if the, that's blocking the urine flow from the kidneys. Kidney stone, what, what they say is it, it's, it, it's not a disease in itself. It's a manifestation of your other metabolic parameters. Um, some people are genetically prone to, to get those for, for some genetic reason. Uh, some, there is something called citrate, uh, which prevents the formation of stones in the urine. Some people genetically are deficient in that or they have less of that. Other genetic diseases that predispose people to get kidney stones, something called uh, hyperoxaluria. You are someone who's, who does not have a strong family history otherwise, and you tend to get uh, stones every now and then. A lot of times um, you can do a 24 hour urine uh, to, to sort of more accurately assess what is what kind of stones you have and what is leading the stone formation. And if you cannot do that 24 hour urine, what we, what's labeled as little link testing here in the United States, um, then uh, there are two things that everyone with kidney stones should do. One, limit the salt intake. The less salt you eat, the better it is for kidney health, for your blood pressure, but also for, for the kidney stone. The reason is about 80% of ki kidney stones are calcium-based stones. And the more salt you eat, the more calcium you tend to lose in the urine and the more stones you form. So less salt. Second, there is a lot of literate, I mean, word in the, in the general media about how much water some, someone should be drinking. And uh, some people would drink a gallon of water, eight glasses of water and whatnot. None of that is medically proven. There are few medical uh, conditions where it's proven for, for you to drink more water where it, it's helpful. And uh, two of those, one is what's called polycystic kidney disease. And the second one is uh, actually kidney stones. The, in someone who has recurrent kidney stones, less salt and more water is helpful. And if you can get testing of the stone itself, that's great. That way you know what kind of stones you have and what needs to be done to prevent those. So the stone, the surgical, so if the stone burden is a lot and the stone is large enough, then typically the urologist will take care of the stones. But the role of the kidney doctor would be to see how we can prevent the stones. And, and that, less salt, more water. And when... Uh, if you can get a, a metabolic uh, parameters checked with the urine collection, a lot of times we do find um, some, let's say if someone is deficient in, in that thing called citrate, we can give them citrate supplement that has to be closely monitored because if you overdo it, it, it can cause a different type of stone. If someone is making a lot of uric acid and getting that type of stone that has a treatment to it, if someone is losing a lot of calcium in the urine, we tend to find out why that's happening and how we can 
decrease that. So there's a lot that can be done to prevent those as well. Um, but um, in general, for most people with kidney stones, less salt and more water is certainly helpful. Thank you so much, doctor, for uh, joining on to our show. It was lovely having you. We did cover a very important topic. Uh, I think a lot of viewers are going to enjoy it. Thank you for the viewers for tuning in. You're watching Sakshi TV with me, Shivani Raj. Thank you.